Okay, while you're standing, we'll go to the next part. So the first part of this talk is explaining that God is not the author of a perfect world where death was there from the beginning. You and I would understand, or those of us that have experienced death, that's not our de definition of a perfect world. We're living in a punished world, a world where the punishment continues. It's logical to think, therefore, that if we were originally not designed to die, that maybe initially afterwards we would live for a long time. And that's the next part of the talk. Is it reasonable to believe, and is it true history, that people once lived for nearly a thousand years, individual people? So let's start off. Hmm. Cool. We're going to read... No... Oh, okay, very good. We're going to read just about eight verses from Genesis. If you don't believe this and don't want to read it, that's okay. But let's go. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, and he blessed them and named them man in the day they were created. Gus on? I'm sorry, um, I'm going to need some help at the back, I think. Oops, too many slides. I can see there's a delay. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. Then the days of Adam, after he became the father of Seth, were 800 years and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Next slide, please. Seth lived 105 years and became the father of Enosh. Then Seth lived 807 years after he became the father of Enosh and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. Take a seat, please. So what's fascinating, uh, you can go back a slide for a moment, thanks, is that for 1,500 years, the average age that people died was 912 years. So for the first 1,500 years of recorded history, the average age people died was 912 years. It's a long time. It wasn't just one person. Some of you who went to Sunday school would have always heard about Methuselah and 969 years. I had a friend who's a professor talking to me the other day. He's a Christian professor, PhD in medicine. And he was clearly under the idea that the Bible just talked about the one odd man. But no, it's not the one odd man. It was for all that period of time that we had people living on average that long. They didn't just um, survive that long, they thrived. As you saw, people were having children quite late in life. So Mo, uh, Noah, for instance, was having children when he was 500 years old. That's a long time, isn't it? But some of them were recorded as having children much younger. And of course, we're not hearing about the, the age they were when they had their first child, just a notable child. So they didn't just survive, they thrived. Um, this has great explanatory power. So what do I mean by, by that? So if I came up with a statement, Dr. Bob killed Mary, um, we used this analogy last talk actually, but he's a doctor now. Actually, that was Mary killed Bob. So anyway, Dr. Bob killed Mary. That's a statement. Does it have any explanatory power? Well, it might do. It might explain why Dr. Bob actually took his scalpel home that night when he would normally never take his scalpel home. It might explain why earlier in the night he took his wife out to a restaurant and got her uncharacteristically drunk. So it has some explanatory power. So we see, if you like, signs of this being helpful or true. So one of the big things about people living for so long is the overlap. So we can have that next slide now. You can see there that Adam dying so late meant that he had an overlap of over 240 years with one of his descendants called Methuselah. 
So for 240 years, Adam was able to tell Methuselah what had happened. And after that, Methuselah lived on for a long period of time and he overlapped with Shem. So who's Shem? Shem's the son of Noah. And he overlapped with Shem for nearly 90 years. So Adam could have been telling Methuselah till he was blue in the face, his story for 240 years, and Methuselah could have been telling Shem until he was blue in the face, the same story for nearly 90 years. So it helps us to understand that not only may have been their books written in stone, but there may have been these, these accounts that got handed down as well. It also helps explain um, theogony, the, arri the arrival of gods. We talked last time about all these strange um, myth uh, mythical gods. Many of them behave, we, I know we talked about some monster gods, but there are a lot of gods that they talk about that seem very human. Every now and again they do something odd. Zeus at one stage put a baby, his baby, one of his babies, into his thigh and kept growing it in his thigh for a long time and then the midwives had to help give birth from his thigh, a bit unusual. But basically they, they're a bit human-like, these gods. Imagine if you were one of the ones that were recently descended coming off Noah's Ark. You were still in that lineage where people were living for long periods of time. Shem, mind you, he was already living a lot shorter than his father Noah, and we'll come back to that. He was already only living about 600 years, and we'll, we'll look at this data very shortly, but there's a big drop off in ages. But basically, the first few generations, they were still living for 600, 400 years. But then later on, the children very soon that were being born were only going to live to 200 years. What would they think about seeing their great-granddad at 450 years old, still looking strong and fit? You'd be tended to call him a god, wouldn't you? And he might be behaving like a god. Imagine how skilled he could have got at fighting, throwing a spear and shooting an arrow. So it gives some explanatory power in these ways as well. Also, we read in the Bible about how very shortly people had cities and they were doing work with metal. If they were living for long periods of time, imagine the accumulation of knowledge that could have happened so quickly. So that's some explanatory power. Here's a graph. Now, this graph has been put together by Dr. John Sanford. He was a professor at Cornell University for about 25 years. He was a professor of genetics. Uh, he became a Christian, and this is just a small, small part of, of the work he did. So what he's done there is he's plotted on a graph the lifespan of Noah and his descendants all the way through to King David and beyond. Now we call this graph an exponential decay curve. And you can see a figure there that says R squared, in this case that's the coefficient of determination, equals 0.96. All that means is that 96% of the variation in the lifespan, 96% of, of what makes those lifespans different, can all be described by that formula, y equals. So this decline in the lifespans follows a very precise mathematical formula. Isn't that fascinating? It's so strong, this graph. If you don't remember anything else tonight, apart from all of Ron's talk, just remember this graph. Because what I wanted you to help you to see is that this is real data. I'm going to do that by getting you onto some marijuana. So here's, here's what happens to marijuana. So when you smoke marijuana, this is from smoking one joint. They're just comparing chronic users with occasional users. Um, some of my patients were smoking marijuana every day. Um, and, and in the workforce, quite fascinating. Um, so what they're looking at is, when you, when you have marijuana, there's a, a molecule, tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, and it, it's, the, it's the important drug if you want to get certain benefits from marijuana. But it decays in your bloodstream, and it decays using, using this curve. Do you recognise it? So if we go back to the previous slide, there you go, it's the same, isn't it? So these are biological decay curves. 
Now keep in mind this biological decay curve goes all the way through to King David and beyond. How did it get there? So some people say that the lifespan data in the Old Testament is fake. It was all made up. Well, here's some questions for you. How could have they created such a curve unless they were, had advanced knowledge of biology? Now, it is possible they had advanced knowledge of biology, but usually in advanced knowledges of biology, we're looking at the curve going in the opposite direction. You know, we start off with two rabbits, and then before long you've got an exponential growth curve, not a decay curve. You start off with ten children, and before long you've got an exponential growth children, a growth curve. Yeah. So, so, okay, maybe they had advanced knowledge in biology. Then they would have needed advanced knowledge in mathematics to make the data fit not just any old exponential growth curve, but to fit it really well. Exponential decay curve, but to fit it really well. And then this would have had to have been done by all sorts of different authors over the centuries. Because remember, the data includes King David. So this, this, not, this package of knowledge had to be transferred. Now, some of the authors of these books were shepherds, some of them were kings. But they all had to have this advanced knowledge. And then the best bit, the best bit about, <laughs> I think the most silliest bit about this idea that it's fake news, it's fake data, is that why would you do that? What would be the motivation for trying to make lifespans decline in an exponential decay curve in a way that precisely matches the formula? Why would anyone do that? And why would you make sure the next generation of authors could do it as well? It makes no sense. So in other words, this is evidence that what we're reading about in the Old Testament is history. It's history that can be explained by the biological sciences and mathematicians like Kristen Wood, who spoke to us last week. Let's get off the grass and move on. Oh. So this click is interesting. Please, please be patient with me. Okay. Then we talked about history. What I found fascinating, and I only discovered it recently, is Josephus of... Um, uh, Josephus, he's an historian. He was born about 37 AD. Uh, and I write about him in my book, Echoes of Jesus. And I write about Josephus because he's one of several... Um, pagan or non-Christian authors who wrote about Jesus and the Christians very early on. Now he wrote a, uh, a, 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 as I said, because he wrote about Jesus, I wanted to explore some things in my book. Was he a good historian? You know, it wouldn't matter if Josephus wrote about Christians and he was a useless historian, so I wanted to know, was he any good as an historian? So I looked at how well Josephus could chronicle or write about events he saw with his own eyes. And if you buy my book, which I'm sure you'll all buy, you'll at least buy four copies each, if you, if you buy my book, you'll realise that he did that very well. But Josephus was a true historian. He cited other authors and he often named them. And what's a cool thing is that many of the other authors he cited, we've got their books as well. So now I could compare how fair he was when he cited somebody else's work. I did find some trends. If a, if a book he was quoting made a song and dance about God, he would tend to downplay that. In other words, he would tend to try and wipe the idea of God a bit into the back. Um, but as other scholars have said, he treated other authors great fairly, uh, very fairly. He, he used their sources, their books, very fairly. He... He wrote in book chapter one of Antiquities of the Jews. Now, this is a big book. It's 44,000 lines in Greek originally. It took him 12 years to, to write. Um, I don't feel so bad that this one took me eight years. Uh, it took 12 years to write. And he was rich at the time. He was sponsored. Um, so he had a lot of advantages over me. It still took him 12 years. Um, what he said in book chapter one of Antiquities of the Jews Chapter 3, paragraph 9, I'm telling you this so I encourage you to look it up. He said that the ancients all agreed that the uh, historians agree that the ancients all lived for about a thousand years. And then he named 11 authors. 
And then he said, go read it for yourself. <laughs> so he knew that some of his readers would find it hard to believe this is true. So he says, well, there's 11 different authors from countries as diverse as, as uh, Egypt, far away, and you can read their writings to see that what I say is true. So that's interesting that it's not just from biological data and mathematics that we can see that what we read in our Old Testament is true data about lifespans, it's also in the history books. Okay, it's takeaway time. So what I'd like you to do is stand up. You've got about 60 seconds to form pairs. First 60 seconds, one of you tells someone else two or three things you learnt. They don't have to be concepts, they might be just interesting facts. And then the next 60 seconds, take turn about. So find someone else just to share with if you've learned anything new today, what that was. Great. So, some people um, I've met when I tell them that my passion is helping people to see that the Bible is actually true history, they wonder why I do it. They, they, they feel that if all you need to, uh, that it seems to, well, they say that all you need is a personal experience. It's nice having a personal experience with your wife, isn't it? But it'd be so much nicer if you could show somebody else that she's real and that you can enjoy her company too. So that's what I do. So 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16 tells the early Christians that they weren't following cleverly devised myths. They were following the information from eyewitnesses. And that's what I hope I'm helping you to become, be able to do, is not necessarily be eyewitnesses, but see the evidence for yourself. Some people say, why did Jesus do lots of miracles? Was he just a show-off, you know, just trying to get some attention, maybe pass the hat around and get some money every time he did a miracle? No, of course not. Jesus did miracles for lots of reasons, but if you read in Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 22, Peter's talking to a crowd of non-believers, and he says, Men of Israel, Jesus of Nazareth was accredited to you by miracles, wonders and signs. That's why he did things like turn water into wine. It was showing some evidence that what he's saying is true. And then of course Mark 12 verse 30 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. It's wonderful that God wants us to love, wants us to love him with all our being and then helps us to love him. It's like in Mark chapter 9, verse 29, where the guy says to Jesus, I believe, help me to believe. All of us have these troubles, especially when you're going through the dark night of the soul, as I talked last week. It's good to know that this isn't just something that you got to, you don't just follow God because you had a great encounter a little while ago and you're trying to remember that when the dark times come. You, you know that it's actually true no matter what you feel. Okay. Now comes the, the biological part, the part that I feel most comfortable with. So last time, last week I was talking about my friends in high school. When they found out I became a Christian, they would rib me about Gilgamesh and all these other words they would throw at me. None of them knew anything about it. And one of the popular things back then, because a lot of my generation were made to go to Sunday school, they knew bits of the Bible. And they knew this stuff about... You know, Methuselah living to 969 years, Noah having kids when he was 500 years, and they say, John, you're a loony. You know, you can't really take that for serious. So anyway, here's some biological evidence that this is reasonable to believe in. So what we've got there is an Aldabra giant tortoise. Now, some of them are known, quite certainly, to be at least 185 years old. One of them possibly is recorded as having lived 225 years. So a big animal that lived for centuries. The other one is a small animal. Anyone, could you put your hand up if you ever heard the word quahog before? No, apparently it's a Canadian term, um, um, perhaps related to their uh, First Nations people. It's a clam, basically, uh, um, and you eat them. This is an ocean quahog. It's a particular one. It's called Artica islandica or Artica islandica. They're only 50 millimetres long. They found some that they believe are still alive at 507 years of age. Now, this is a complex little beastie. 
You know, we have uh, cells and our cells are super complex. It has cells and they're super complex. It has a part of one of its cells called a mitochondria. It's like an electrical power station. And this mitochondria's DNA is as complex as most other animals. But it lives to 500 years plus. This is a coral. These are deep water corals. Deep water corals, they go from about 300 metres down to 3,000 metres. In other words, these aren't the corals that you snorkel over at Lady Elliot Island. Uh, these are really deep. Um, that deep, they're quite cold and it's quite dark. Um, now, corals are fascinating animals. Most of the time, we're sort of used to the idea of one head and, and many bodies, but this is... Uh, well, sorry, um, one body, many heads, as in Medusa mistakes. This is, this is a creature that's got this body that's got heads all over it. You know, I'm almost sort of wearing a costume with lots of little, you know, voodoo heads on it, but I don't think that would have gone down too well here. Um, so imagine one body with lots of heads. That's what these corals are. They share everything through this stuff called coelacanth, cynosarc. So... These corals that we're talking about are called Leopaths glabarina. Now they grow as deep as 1,400 metres. They're quite deep. They grow to about 34 centimetres in height. They are a very complex animal. The ones off Hawaii they have got, they say they are still alive at 4,200 years. That's a long time to be alive, isn't it? This one here, this is a freshwater polyp. It's quite small, they're about 10 millimetres long. Hydra species is what they're called. A guy called Dr. Dominic Martinez, back in 2010, he was given $1.2 million US to research these little critters. And the research was funded because they seem to be immortal. And he concluded, in, in a layperson version of some of his research, that he said, I do believe that individual hydra can live forever. And yet they too are a complex creature. They seem to, uh, no, I won't, we're running out of time, so I'll move on. Okay, so sharks. Some people say, John, all that stuff that you said is a bit irrelevant because they're weird creatures. You know, we're humans, we're a bit different. As I said, we all have this great complexity within ourselves. But here we got a, a shark. Now the one on, on that side, uh, it's called somniosis microcephalus. It basically means it's a bit sleepy and it's got a small head. Uh, my wife said that's why it's always smiling. It's quite simple. <laughs> so so, so they, they caught 28 females of these and they said that they're all around their 200 plus age. But one of them, they believe, is over 300 years of age. So once again, a very big creature. Um, off to the other side, excuse me for a minute, off to the other side, you'll see a shark we're much more familiar with. That's really, that's sometimes called the Greenland shark. You'll see the white pointer, so it's in our waters. It's Carcharodon carcariasis. Um, Somniosis microcephalus is a big shark. It has a fork length, so from the tip of its nose to here, it's five metres long. Our great whites are about six metres, fairly similar in size. But Somniosis, the smiley one, um, as I said, it can live for hundreds of years, whereas the great white pointer, no loss there, I don't care, it only lives for 60. If it only lived for 20, I'd be even happier. So there you go. I do like ocean swimming. If you could pass this around, and, uh, and when you hold it, just remember that's an animal that lives for centuries. Centuries. Here's another animal. So that's a Bellinia mysticetus. Now it's a big whale, it's about 20 metres long. Now this is a bit more relevant to us because like us it's a mammal. It has her and her. It has hair and fur, it has three middle ear bones, it has sweat glands, it has mammary glands, it has a four-chambered heart. They believe that these live for up to 200 years. So I'm just trying to give you examples that there are animals out there that live for centuries, even this long after the curse. Now this one is very small. This is a bat, a fairly common bat, I believe, Myotis branti. It only weighs five to seven grams. Now normally in biology we would say there's a bit of a, mm, a relationship between size and age. 
These little guys shouldn't live very long at all. But one of them has lived, well, one of them, some of the ones they've caught, one of them lived for 41 years. To put that into a human context, if that was, if we, if that was our size or if we, were, if we had its ability, it'd be like us at 100 years of age being able to sprint and be as agile as when we were in our teens. And so some animals don't age. So do people once live for centuries? I would say that based on the biology of the world around us, given that there are very big and complex animals that can live for hundreds of years, it's reasonable to believe that. Can we do better than that? Well, we can, but we're going to have to miss out on the angry woman. Okay. If ageing and dying is related to genetics, then we should see, perhaps given that there are 7 billion people on the face of the world and we've been here doing biology for a little while now, we should see evidence that some people have mutations that make them age faster. So the one on the left there is uh, Huntington-Guilford syndrome. So this is called childhood progeria. So they age quicker. They don't live past the age of puberty and they die as old people. Then you'll see Werner's syndrome on the right. Uh, that's much more common, especially in the Japanese population. Um, Werner's syndrome, once they get to puberty, they start to age. And once they're about 40 years old, they look like they're 80. So what I'm trying to say is there's a strong genetic element to ageing. If mutations can make people age faster now, isn't it reasonable to believe that once upon a time, our ancestors had some mutations that have made us all age quicker. And that brings us right back to that graph. Remember that biological decay curve I want you to take home. Remember I said that before the flood, people lived on average 912 years. After that, it precipitously dropped. Uh, Samford and other geneticists think it can be explained this way. For a start, there's only eight people on the ark. So we call that a genetic bottleneck. So suddenly all the genetic diversity in the big human population is shrunk to just a few people. And that's usually disastrous for the future health of a population. Secondly, how old was Noah at least when he gave birth to Shem and his two other named brothers? 500. Now, if, if that was a woman, it wouldn't be a problem. You women have certain advantages. When you're born, you're born with all your eggs, all your ova. But us men, we're a bit different. We, we've got to be busy always doing stuff. So we're always making sperm and we keep making sperm. So the sperm that we're born with, they have to keep dividing, dividing and dividing. In other words, copies of copies of copies. So by the time you're 50 as a male, some of your sperm have been copied 840 times. I don't know what it would look like if you had a photocopy and you copied something 840 times, keeping on putting it down, taking a copy, putting that one on, putting another one on, blah, blah, blah. It's not going to look so good, probably. So if Noah was already 500 years old, then it's possible that what we see there is the problem of old people giving birth. And then there may have been some other examples there about where some of these age-related mutations came in. What do these three creatures have in common? Well, once upon a time, they were probably all beautiful. <laughs> Denia rario is a zebrafish, but it definitely doesn't look like that. But there is a fish called the zebrafish. The great frigate birds, you can see the great frigate birds on Lady Elliot Island. Um, and you probably could see someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger on a place like Lady Elliot Island, but I think he'd probably book the whole place out. Uh, now, these creatures all have one thing in common, that as um, that the telomeres, which are like, you know how you you've got shoelaces, and shoelaces have a plasticky bit at the end to stop them fraying. Telomeres are um, the, the plasticky bits that stop your DNA fraying. So these creatures, if that DNA, if that, that plasticky bit, the telomere decays, it has consequences. That's what happens with Werner syndrome. It's basically an advancement of the decaying of the plasticky bits. But it's never simple in biology. What do these creatures have in common? Apart from being beautiful, all of them, 
in their own way. These actually don't do that. Their telomeres get longer as they get older. So in other words, not just a simple thing, but certainly genetics seems to explain the data. So I hope I've left you with an understanding that the data is real. It's not fake, the data of the ages of the lifespans. That's the first thing I hope I've persuaded you. I hope I've also persuaded you that God didn't make this world with death being part and parcel of it. He's not like that. Death is a punishment that we're living uh, with every day of our lives. And three, there are biological reasons for believing it's not absurd, it's not stupid to believe that once upon a time people could have lived for many, many hundreds of years. The good news, of course, is that no matter what happens to these bodies, you can live forever. So John chapter 11, in that same chapter about Jesus' mate Lazarus dying, it says, Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, will live. And that's probably the most important message of the night as well. How about we pray, and then we'll have Ron come up and do some Q&A. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for giving us a clear history of where we come from. Thank you, Jesus, that you know what it's like to suffer. You know what it's like to die. You know what it's like to see your loved ones die. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, you can lift our souls when we are so troubled by death and suffering. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you can heal us well. How we love you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you.